This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Welcome uh, back to the one who was here last time, and I'm just using new faces, it's uh, also great that uh, you have joined us. Um, uh, we're going to talk today about um, Eckhart and Böhmer, so um, uh, going back to the beginning of, uh, of uh, the origins of, of, sort of the materialisms that we are investigating. Uh, last week we spent some time looking at contemporary uh, relevance of materialism, the return of materialism in continental philosophy, and uh, we discussed a little bit uh, some of the conceptions of matter that have been um, uh, relevant in history of philosophy. We talked about imperfection, we talked about the virtual principle of individuation, we talked about processual dynamic conceptions of matter as opposed to inert static conceptions of matter. Also mentioned historical materialism a little bit, and um, I basically said um, so I, I sort of start to advance the idea that philosophical thought is a kind of thinking that always uh, seeks or is mindful of the, the outside of thought, and I think that dialectic between the outside of thought and thought, between what is not thought and consciousness, this classical formula, we get something that is materialism. I'm going to try to say or indicate that I think it is um, uh, an important moment in thought that that we have maybe not thought about so much for the last decades or so, but it's coming back now and that we want to investigate. And that part of the, the point of this series is to um, to trace this um, what you might call what I'm going to call just you know this deep materialism, this sort of profound point of materialism um, in a, 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 a subterranean history of materialism in German philosophy. And uh, I indicated that uh, the starting point of that is, is going to be uh, Eckhart and Goethe. So the end of the Middle Ages, I also mentioned to you this wonderful study, uh, six major themes of um, uh, physics and the end of, uh, of, uh, of the Middle Ages by uh, Heim Sewage, which was published in the 1920s, just a very worthwhile book to read. And I've actually found that Adorno does use it in his lectures on metaphysics, concept of problems, he draws on it all the time without saying as much. Have you spelled Heim Sewage? Uh, Heim, as in Heimat, yeah. and then Sewage, S O E T H. Thanks. Um, so uh, yeah, so so that's the that was that's the idea, and I've sent around some texts for pre-reading. Um, so we'll say a little bit about them, and then um, we'll look at them in detail because, as as I also explained last time, the idea of the of this seminar is to really spend some time looking at the actual texts uh, in German and and also in English in translation. That's fun too, but to actually discuss some passages in these uh, in in these texts. Um, now, before we start, as I also said last time, um, I would like uh, to ask one of you each time to, to, to make a protocol of the session. Uh, you can do that in the way that you like, it doesn't have to follow a particular format, it can just be an impression or note taking. Or, but um, I would like uh, each time to ask one of the people who are here to do that and, and to send it to me or to our email list uh, before the next session so you can read it through. And can I ask anyone to volunteer to do that? No? Okay, good. Great. And uh, if you could do that, I'd be wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, then we start. Um, uh, and uh, so I'll give a, a very short introduction to indicate why I've chosen these uh, texts to look at. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, Eckhart, so that's the 14th century, as you all know. The text uh, von der Abgeschiedenheit on, on Detachment, which is a sermon, I think. Uh, Actually, this text um, uh, requires a bit of an introduction because uh, the authorship of it is contested. It is the, the most well-known text by Eckhart and also one that was uh, in circulation wide, widely from, uh, right from the beginning. It became very popular in the time in which uh, Böhme wrote, so that end of the 16th century, beginning of the 17th century. Um, but, uh, uh, but there is a discussion that the, the editor of the, of the standard historical critical edition of, um, of Meister Eckhart um, assumes that it is genuine, 
but a lot of that was in the 50s when this technical this volume was published that that, that um, edition of the collected works has been uh, going on for many decades now but this particular volume was um, published in the 1950s since then there has been a lot of, uh, of scholarly discussion around this text and a lot of people think that it may not be genuine in the sense that it may not have been, have been written by Eckhart himself but certainly by by people who have been very close to him and the ideas in it are very much in line with uh, Eckhart's own uh, thinking and for us of course in terms of the reception this text has been very important for the reception of Eckhart's thought in the, in the German context right from um, the end of the Middle Ages. And it introduces a very important concept, detachment, Abgeschiedenheit. Uh, it doesn't sound very materialist, and so that's why it's important for us to, to look at it and see what, what it means, what Eckhart means by it. And then there's a second text that I asked you to read from Edlin Mention, The Noble Man, or On the Noble Man, which is an interpretation of uh, Luke 19, verse 12. A certain nobleman went away to a distant country to gain a kingdom for himself and returned. And of course, uh, that's almost like a summary of the phenomenology of spirit, if you put it like that. <laughs> so I think that's a, that's a wonderful, um, that's a, a wonderful statement uh, to, to start to look at in, uh, in, the, in the context of our, uh, of our discussion of materialism. Um, so that those are the two texts by, by, by Eckhart. This, in the second text, the distinction between the inner man and the outer man plays a big role. We will learn to see that, and also the relation between God and um, the individual human being. And an idea that for um, uh, Eckhart is important, the idea that there is a divine spark in, in, in everyone, which is an emptiness, which is a place that is not filled. And, um, there we are, I think, at, at the birthplace of a typical notion of subjectivity that becomes central to, to the whole of German uh, thought. Um, how we can see Eckhart as, as playing a role in a materialist account of that subjectivity is something that we, we can discuss. Yeah. Uh, there is also in this text um, a distinction which uh, uh, Eckhart makes between knowing something and knowing that you know something. So between consciousness and self-consciousness, which is also an important point. That, that same distinction had been made by Aristotle, but of course it also prefigures certain aspects of what came later in German Judaism. So that, those are the two texts by, by Eckhart. And then uh, we will look at um, Böhme. So I, suppose, I, I suggest that we spend, let's say, the first hour talking about Eckhart and the second one talking about Böhme. That's, a couple, that's, uh, that's later. Yeah. Um, but um, Böhme is also important for, for our history. Not so much for the introduction of the principle of subjectivity. That's really what I would say we get from, from Eckhart. Um, but for a particular way of looking at nature as a at matter, sorry, as a as a dynamic magnitude, there is um, uh, although there is a lingering dualism in uh, in, in Bohm's text, there is a very clear idea that matter is alive, that the whole universe can be seen in the image of of of, of the human being. So the, the macanthropos and the, and and and, and the, the, the big the big man and the small man. But also um, that this matter is in process and develops by oppositions, by a struggle of oppositions. So we get a dialectical idea in Böhme and we get a dynamic processual materialism in Böhme, in a way. And there's much more to be said about that, um, uh, but we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit. Just so, dynamic matter on the one hand, and subjectivity uh, on the other. Yeah? Um, you might say that in Eckhart, the principle of creation or creativity is, de is in a way de-transcendentalized, although so there is a ground prepared for a de-transcendentalization of this idea of creation and creativity into the idea of the divine spark in the soul. Uh, you might say, um, if you want to read Eckhart in a very uh, radical sense, that um, that he uh, makes man into the creator of God, 
because he shows that, uh, or in, in, in his, uh, we can look at this now, in his text it becomes clear that uh, for him there is this, this emptiness in, in uh, at the very heart of human, of human personal existence, and, the, and in this emptiness God can become present. But he says literally God needs us as much as, as we need God. What happens at the heart of, of, of the subject, this emptiness that is discovered and filled, filled up, <coughs> that is the process of creation, of creativity. And that is, in a way, uh, something that, that is beyond the distinction between the transcendent divine reality and um, uh, uh, a human reality. So that's one, one point, I think, to keep in mind. The other one is that uh, for Eckhart, this, this principle of subjectivity, this principle of emptiness, is ubiquitous. It does not just apply to the human being, but it spreads out all over the world, all, all over uh, creation, in everything that is that he calls that is, is created. He says, all corn means wheat, all metal gold, all birth, the human being. So in all of reality, there is this orientation on a on a, on a movement towards purification or towards something coming out of the heart of things that makes them into what they, in a way, already are. And so it's ubiquitous. And the third point I think that's important in the, in the text, as we have seen as we, as we have read them, is that um, there is here uh, an early critique of, and that has to do with cultural aspects, an early critique of authority, an early critique of the church as an institution. There is a clear idea, and that's also, I think, one of the backgrounds for uh, the condemnation of a number of propositions by Eckhart, by the Pope, shortly after Eckhart died. Um, there is here the idea that we don't need the church for salvation. We don't need uh, the, the priests for our relation to God. <coughs> it is not, um, uh, it's not a relation that is um, uh, determined by the sacraments at all. The relation between me and God is not a sacramental one, but it is an existential lived one. So it's a very, you might say, it's almost like a, uh, a, an early form of ref ref reformation thought that you, that you get in, uh, in Eckhart. And that's, of course, a very important point, because as I said last time, materialism is always connected with practices of liberation, practices of emancipation. And one of the overall claims that I think I'd like to make is that um, uh, it is only by this relation to the outside of thought that is characteristic of materialism that we can get these practices of emancipation and liberation. And we see it very clearly in um, Eckhart's mysticism, which precisely because of its mysticism is, is a critique of authoritative structures in uh, religious experience. There's a lot to be said about that point, uh, which I will not do, but it would be for those who are interested in it. It would be uh, if you don't, if you haven't read it, it would be good to read uh, Gershom Scholem's book on trends in Jewish mysticism. Where Scholem explains that um, the mystic is usually the one who advances uh, an idea like this: that, that, that the relationship to God is not something that, that has to be mediated by an institution or a religious practice or by sacraments, but is direct. But that the mystic very often uh, can can make make his statements or, or say what he or she has to say only within a strongly developed institution. And you see this in Eckhart, but you see this in many other mystics of that time and later. And they look for an institution, church or religion or whatever it is, uh, in order to, 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 to make a point that actually is a kind of deconstruction or a dismantling of the very idea of that. You see that also in, uh, in Islamic uh, mysticism, Sufi mysticism, you see it in Kabbalistic uh, Jewish mysticism, and you see it also quite clearly in Eckhart. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's, uh, th those are three important points, I think, uh, that, that, we, uh, that we have defined in, in, uh, in the text. I'll say a bit more about Burma when, uh, when, when we get to that, uh, but maybe it would be good to have a little look at the texts now first. So um, well, it was, it's always a little bit of a trial to get into these kinds of discussions, certainly at the beginning of the, of the year of the seminar, so I have to just give it a bit of time. Um, and we have to make, when we speak about the text like on detachment, we also have to bear in mind that 
And then Böhm says the same thing, but then Eckhart makes a point of saying, yeah, this is not something that has to do with uh, being learned or you know, knowing a lot, or, but there is a kind of, you can only understand what he's talking about when he speaks of speaks of, of Akashidenheit, when there is a kind of Akashidenheit of attachment also in yourself. So I think we have to, we have to try to, uh, we have to try to, to, to approach the text in, in that way. In order to do that, I'd just like to, um, to, to ask um, um, uh, if, who, who, has, who has read the text in preparation and, and, and what your sort of initial responses to it have been, what, uh, what you think stands out in terms of themes that, that, uh, that come across here that you might want to look at in more detail. Can I ask any one of you to, to, to say something? Yeah. Yeah, I, I did read um, the Eckhart fairly quickly, unfortunately, but um, I did like it a lot. Um, and I thought there were some interesting tensions between the Akashinheit and between um, the Eagle Mensch, and perhaps we, we can talk about this. And as I took the text, um, he basically developed the idea of what Akashinheit is in contrast to the three. Um, say concepts of Liebe, Demut, and um, Mitgefühl. So that would be, um, yeah. I don't know how this is translated, either passion or love, how, how do you mean? Empathy. Empathy. Um, oh, no, yeah, love, love. Yeah, love. The first one is love in the translation. The, the first one is love, and the, the second one is Demut. He has it, whatever that is in the translation. Yeah, it's called well, humility. Um, and then the third one was um, empathy or midnight. Um, yeah. And basically, out of these, these oppositions, um, he develops why it is a necessity to develop a state of Akashinheit in order to let God come to you and not the other way around. Exactly. Um, and, um, and that is perhaps the moment of creation that, that you also um, uh, mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, and I suppose, I don't want to go too far now, but, but the point of the Abgeschiedenheit is, as I read it, that it is for no sake but for its own sake. Because um, only if you develop the state of being of Nachbeschiedenheit for no other reason than for the reason of its own sake, only then you are disentangled from the other elements or concepts or worldlinesses, if that's a, a plural um, that perhaps might, might, might interfere with, with the whole concept. That's, that's how I learned. So can you say that again? If I didn't really follow the, uh, the, the, the last thing that I, that I think is perhaps the most important one, at least in my reading of the text, is that, that the Abgeschiedenheit is for no other purpose than for its own sake. And the moment you sort of um, make it a goal that you achieve anything other than the Abgeschiedenheit itself, it's no longer a form of Akashidenheit, but it already seeks another purpose, and therefore it is again entangled in, in, in elements such as love, demut, uh, love, uh, what was the other one? Yeah. Uh, cash, like that, yeah. example. Yeah. So, so in order to have the real reinheit, the, the purity of the Akashidenheit, it must be for its own sake only and for no other purpose. And then the purpose is being invited out of itself. That's how I, I read it. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so there is a bit of, but it's been, you, you said there's a bit of conflict with the uh, with the second text. I think there is a bit of a conflict with the, with the second text, and that is that the second text does create a purpose of the what he calls uh, the evil man of the what's the English translation of that? The noble man. The noble man, and, and that's the noble man, um, which. Reading the two texts and in parallel one to the other, the noble man to me would be the man who achieves the, con the, the, the state of being Akashin, of Akashin height. Yeah. But then he, here in the Kritis Ebene Menschen, or from Ebene Menschen, he gives it a purpose, and that is Ebene's Leben, um, that is um, eternity. 
um, why the Akushin had itself does not have a purpose, but invites a purpose. And I think that is an interesting yeah. conflict between the two texts. Yeah, okay, that's very good. Yeah, okay, so we, uh, well, we talked about that. Yeah, okay. Are there other responses that people want to share? Well, the other one, yeah, uh, that's, uh, I actually found that the, 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 the um, uh, I need to mention, it's strongly theological, it's about God's seed growing in the virgin, and yeah. the naturalist in that sense. And there's another distinction between the two texts, and that uh, on Akushin has this, again, it's kind of distinction of difference and about merging and oneness, whereas, um, no, so I did favour that rather, you know, there's sense of attachment to distinction, whereas Wunderschied is, is all the terms which is um, uh, uh, criticised and, and opposed in the other text where we have to get beyond the distinction of difference. And, yeah. Um, so it seems that the, 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 his project is called in two directions, you know, merging but also separating. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Other points? No? Well, I think maybe the detachment test text I mean, certainly strikes me as, as the more one orthodox one, you know, and in part to reasons I've been discussed already, but it's, it's almost, um, I mean, there's no concern in it with a kind of pietistic telos. I mean, there's, there's no, I, you know, and, and in a sense, you know, God is coming to the detached person, you know, cap in hand, you know, wanting the, the attention of the detached person, but the detached person doesn't even want God. Uh, you know, I mean, as you said, just wants the, the, the detachment. So it seems to be moving towards something which is kind of logically independent, um, you know, both of God and, you know, religion. Yeah, exactly. It, is, it seems to be moving in a, in a, as you said, in the direction in which, uh, in which you don't even want God, uh, or as, in a, as in one of, in like one of, one of Eckhart's prayers, it says, I pray to God that he rids me of God. Yeah? Um, and that's the Kriet macht Gottes, or something like that. Um, so I think that's something that's, that's, that's clear here. And he even says, in, uh, in, uh, I'm now using uh, the eight and around, this, this dual uh, language edition of our text. Um, I'm reading from page two, where, and that, that's where I think it comes out very clearly, this contradiction that we're talking about. Um, uh, <coughs> the Abgeschiedenheit bleibt in sich selbst. The attachment rests within itself. Nun aber kann kein hinausgehen, jemals so hochstehen wie das darin bleiben in sich selbst. Now, no going out can ever be so noble, but, uh, but remaining within is nobler still. And uh, so the, our nobleman went away, then, to, that, that's Einhinalski, went away to a distant country to gain a kingdom for himself and returned. Yeah? So um, the detachment of the, of the first text seems to, to preclude this kind of going out of yourself in order to, to, to find something and then return to yourself. The second text is perhaps more theological in the way that this approaches that, because you might say this nobleman, and there's a lot to say about the, the stages of the, of the process, but this nobleman is, is, is of course also called himself, who also goes out to create a kingdom for himself and return to the creation of man. So it seems to me that that, that text can be read, and it, it is about what makes, what makes us noble, that is about what nobility is, uh, but it is also about um, God as it's about the process of creation, and you see how well, doesn't, doesn't that kind of imply that God um, has to do something in order to be noble, which is yeah. kind of irrational? Yeah, 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 of course that is irrational, and and it's always the case with, uh, in this in both of these texts, I think that I mean you know you can read them in a very very traditional sort of orthodox way, and it's all monkey dory, but there's something brewing up. Underneath, and that's what I think we're interested in when we talk about the place of Eckhart in the concept of materialism, um, because it, it seems to me that yeah, that, that is what what it. The inconsistencies point to to saying things like God also needs to do something. I mean, he even says in the first text, detachment compels God to love me. So if I'm detached, then God, I'm, I'm, if God has no choice. I'm almost catching him. Yeah, or uh, he, he can't resist. He can't resist what, uh, to 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 come to me. Love, humility, empathy, 
they are great, but without attachment, they can't even arise. And because, and he said, that, you know, it's, I mean, it's, let's we'll just read it a little bit from, from the first page. Can I, can I come back to the sentence? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I mean, the, the, the one that you said, um, are the Abschiedenheit bleibt in sich selbst, whatever that is in English, nun aber kann kein Klaus geben, jemand so hoch stehen, wie das darin bleiben in sich selbst. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if somebody has the English version and these. Yeah, so to remain within yourself is no worse thing. Yeah. I, I, I'm not quite sure if I followed what you were saying in terms of that this points to a contradiction, because I don't think it does at all. Um, because I do see the Abgeschiedenheit as a constructive pro a, a process and not as a negative process. And that is the difference between the Abgeschiedenheit and the Demut and the Love and the whatever that is. So the Abgeschiedenheit is not, in a way, and, and, and I think this is what the sentence perhaps says, it's not a form of giving things up and displacing yourself, but a sort of, and, and that is why it's not, it's, it's, it's not leaving itself. Um, so there is a difference in, in the qualities between, I think, Demut, Midlight, Liebe, which is the moments that you, oh, this is, uh, which are the concepts that you have want to give up. But the Abgeschiedenheit is different from that, in that the Abgeschiedenheit is already free from any of those, so it's a constructive process rather than a negative process. And therefore, it doesn't move out of itself, but stays in itself. What do you mean by constructive? It's a constructive as a, as, 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 as a project. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose that's, that's what I believe. And so, um, so I'm not quite sure if I understood what you were saying about this one sentence earlier. Um, no, I, just a few lines earlier, it was about the, um, the lift in uh, the self, the destruction or negation of the self, so it seems practically unconstructive. Um, Sorry, where, where do you see that? Um, just, just about a couple of sentences prior to the passage which you yeah, had read earlier. So yeah, perfect humility enters the destruction of self. Yeah. And that's why perfect humility is... Vollkommen der Demut zielt beim Vernichten seiner selbst. Yeah, but I think Dirk was saying that the Demut, Liebe and Mitgefühl do involve a negation, whereas Abgeschiedenheit, he was trying to say, does not, so... Abgeschiedenheit, yeah, I think that's your point, yeah, yeah, indeed. Abgeschiedenheit is a project. Abgeschiedenheit is first from a project, and it entails all these negations in itself. And so, as a project, it is a constructive one and not a negative one. I think that's, that's the point of this line. Whereas Demut, um, etc., have, have moments of, of negativity that, that the Abgeschiedenheit, just as a project, as, as a construction that, that evolves, doesn't. So it's basically the opposite direction of giving up all the other elements. But, but again, in the passage about the negation itself, he says that um, um, in English, humility can exist without detachment, but perfect detachment cannot exist without perfect humility. Uh, for perfect humility ends in the destruction of self, and that's why, therefore, um, in terms of perfect attachment and perfect humility coincide. So the sense of these projects are going in different directions um, doesn't seem to be one out of the text. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt. Yeah, I, I, I read it differently because I think the action had contains an element of demon in itself. So, so it, it's, it's in a way an all-conclusive, an, an all-encompassing project that, that he's describing. Right. Um, which then entails the other elements, yeah. but non directional, as it were. Okay, well, let's, 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 let's see how far we can get with it. So, um, you, you might say in, in the, 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 the text on the, on the noble man, there is an end point, in, in there is a process described, an itinerary towards something. Um, and that might be, might be called state of, 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 of nobility or the state of uh, um, uh, a mystical union with God, which is a kind of emptying of self, um, uh, but it is also a gaining of a kingdom. Yeah? 
So this, this you might say, I mean, that's I think what, what, you're, what you're getting at, that the end point of the process of the nobleman is, is precisely the Akushimana, that is described in, in the first text. Uh, uh, the way to get there is then, I think, what, what should concern us. How, how, how do you get there? And how does the process of becoming detached relate to this more familiar process of um, exercising your virtue? So learning how to be, how to love, learning how to be uh, humble, and learning how to be uh, be em em empathetic. Yeah, that's the that's the question. Yeah, and, and I guess that's exactly the point. But Abgeschiedenheit is a process. How do we get there, rather than how do we get rid of other uh, other elements of, of achieving this goal? So I suppose that that's yeah. perhaps okay. the uh, yeah. structure that I'm looking at. Yeah, I see that point. But it is, but it is quite explicit in saying that. Um, in kind of downgrading, you know, traditional, you know, Christian virtues, you know, like compassion and so on. But, you know, as if the point he's trying to make is that none of this stuff is necessary. If you get to detachment first, you don't need anything else. So, so there isn't really a sense in this text of, you know, these are the things you've got to do before you... I mean, although it's true that um, detachment can flourish humility, I mean, that is the only real concession made to some kind of, um, to the idea of some kind of process leading to detachment. Yeah. That's right. If we look at the text, let's begin at the beginning, okay? Um, which one? Yeah. On detachment. Do you mind if I read a little bit so we get uh, the sentence, yeah? Uh, I'll read it in English, okay? I have read many writings of pagan masters and of prophets and of the Old and New Testaments and have sought earnestly and with all diligence to discover which is the best and highest virtue whereby a man may chiefly and most firmly join himself to God and whereby a man may become by grace what God is by nature and whereby a man may come closest to his image when he was in God wherein there was no difference between him and God before God made creatures. Yeah? That's already quite a lot, uh, to put it like that. But what we see is that Eckhart starts to write, I think, by saying, I have been very busy. I have been very busy to, to find something. I've been, I've been studying and I've been looking how to become more virtuous. I've been looking uh, at the pagan masters, the prophets, the Old Testaments, the New Testaments, you know. This is somebody who, who, who out of a desire to, be, to, to, to become something or find something, has gone out of his way. Yeah? Um, and what is it that he, has, that he has tried to find? To join himself to God. And to become by grace what God is by nature. Now, to become something by grace means, of course, that um, it is given to you. It, you know, you know, you don't do something for it. So there's a distinction between work and, and, and grace. So becoming busy to expect that you are uh, being being handed grace. Yeah, that's an, an internal, internal contradiction, something that we need to talk about. Yeah? It's almost uh, as if Weber is talking here. This is pro Protestant work ethic, uh, almost, in the first sentence already. Yeah? So there is something there. But nevertheless, okay, that's what, what, what the, the goal was. And whereby a man may come closest to his image when he was in God. Um, und mit der der Mensch ganz gleich wäre den Bilde, wie er in Gott war, in dem zwischen ihm und Gott ein Unterschied war, bevor Gott die Kreaturen erschuf. So there is speaking again of a return to a state of a unity between God and the human being before there was there were creatures. Yeah? So that's a that's a radical program. Yeah? After a thorough then he goes on, after a thorough study of these writings I find, as well as my reason can testify or perceive, that only pure detachment surpasses all things, for all virtues have some regard to creatures, but detachment is free of all creatures. So the first attempt 
the first attempt to find virtue in order to free yourself of creatureliness and to return to an identity with God yeah, is already the second sentence taken back, de deconstructed, because what I have found, he says, is that only pure detachment can do this. And pure detachment is brought into an opposition with virtue. But isn't, uh, there's also a kind of contradiction in the first part of the sentence, because he says, well, I've been looking into this. You know, obviously I've been reading the Bible, and I've been reading lots of pagan stuff as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, did people say that kind of thing in the Middle Ages? Well, there was, there was, I mean, because there's only one book, really, wasn't there? Um, to, 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 to be taken seriously. No, no, no. There was, there was a, well, of course, we did, there's a, but, but of course, there was a whole collection of, of uh, excerpts from, from Aristotle. And, and, so, so they tried to kind of say, oh, this was some kind of weird yeah, thing of, yeah. of, of the truth. Um, As Dante says, Aristotle and Plato, uh, they, they can't go to heaven, but in hell they are in, in the best part of it. <laughs> they are they're left in peace because they got so close, but they they were born before they, they died before the Savior. They even say you only got this list in, in which the truth, uh, i.e. Christianity, is just one item amongst many. Yeah, so uh, that is true. And what I want I would want to point out in the text is precisely those elements. So although it is a well-known rhetorical flourish to start um, a treatise by saying the pagans have said this and lo and behold uh, uh, the Bible says it too and we can even understand it better, here you taste almost in it that he doesn't make a distinction between the heathens and the prophets. Uh, all he wants is, uh, all he wants is, is, is his, his goal. Yeah. So I think there is certainly, I mean this is the whole point, you know, to put it in one word, Eckhart was an atheist. Um, struck, there was a little atheist in Eckhart struggling to come out, as it were. And that, that's something you find in, in the way he starts to write here. Yeah, I would, I would say that. Um, so that is a bit of a, a, another contradiction. Yeah. We haven't solved the point of conflict between grace and, and looking for something. Is detachment, is that the result of, of grace? That's a question that we, that we may ask. Yeah. Only pure detachment surpasses all things, and detachment is free of all creatures. So once we reach the state of, state of detachment, we are no longer in the sphere of the created. And he finds it within himself. Uh, or, or he says the noble man, the inner man, is the, is the person who, who, has, who has got this detachment. Now, <coughs> It's just one word you didn't pick up on earlier in the, uh, yeah. in the end of the first sentence, it's just the, um, the, the idea of the image, um, uh, yeah. the builder. Uh, and it comes up more, I think, in, in a noble text, Eckhart's play with, with the word builder in German, it's kind of very image, image, bigger, yeah. form, form, and also used in various verbal senses as well. So he, he, he's, he's subjected that quite a lot of yeah. uh, linguistic um, attention and, uh, and using it very interesting words. To characterise the process, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's not the you you lose your original form in the process of. Process. That's a very good point. Yeah, of course. The, he he says built, which means image, but also uh, a created form. And of course, in our history of German materialism, that was a key concept because we find it in, in Bildung in the German in the, in the notion of and we find it in Goethe in Goethe's materialism in. Uh, in uh, the the creative form that is built it. So the Nazis sorry is not doing that. But of course that is a very important point and um, it is a process, it is something that is done. And it has to be done. Stages have to be gone through. There is an itinerario, a journey towards. So and this journey is of dialectical nature. That's something that I think is already also present in, in the little opening that we read here because you start doing something, looking at all the sources, being busy, to be virtuous, to find that actually it's not there. Yeah? So the, the, the shaitan, the, the failing, is already stated right in the, first, in the opening of the text. Something is attempted, and then it fails, and then you know you might, and something else might happen. And that is what I put to you as the basic structure of material existence. Um, and then, 
it gets better and better all the time. He introduce then he goes to the to the to the to the scriptures, and then he introduces Martha, and we all know the story of Martha and Mary, um, Jesus visiting the household of Martha and Mary. Martha being busy to prepare everything for the, the arrival of Jesus, making sure the house is in order and being very busy. And Maria, Mary, only sitting at his not that wasn't his mother, it's not Mary, uh, sitting at his feet, listening to him, talking to him, having a, a conversation about uh, 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 all things spiritual. And then Martha gets angry and says, "Somebody will have to make sure that there's food on the table." And then um, uh, Jesus says to Martha. Only one thing is necessary, which is as much as to say, Martha, he who would be serene and pure, needs but one thing, detachment. And this distinction between Martha and Mary is sometimes also taken up as the distinction between the, the, the vita activa, as Hannah Arendt would have said, the active life, and the contemplative life, the vita contemplative. And with that distinction between the active life and the contemplative life, we are, of course, firmly within what we call philosophical idealism. There is the material world, the bodily world, the world of work, the world of, the world of creation, and then there is the spiritual world, the world of truth, the world of forms, the world of transcendence. And this text, this Bible text, has been read very often in that way. Um, and then it leads to all sorts of questions and also a, probably a justified uh, sense of, uh, of um, uh, uh, lying, <coughs> of that in, 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 in insult, uh, because of course Mary Martha does have a point. And uh, it's sometimes difficult to understand this part of text in such a way that, that that point is done, done justice. But nevertheless, um, uh, I don't think that, that Eckhart is at all, he, he just invokes this here uh, in a very traditional sort of way, but it leads us again to the same dialectical question, what is the relation between Martha and, and, and Mary in the story? Eckhart identifies himself here with Martha, because he is the one who was, of course, busy cleaning up the house of the Lord, um, and then, uh, and then, then when he came, or it, it turned out that, that all of that was not what it was about. Mm -hmm. So it, I think it is very, very, uh, yeah, you see how he does that. Huh? And then he, um, well, we can't read the whole text this way, but then he goes on and he says, the teachers greatly praise love. Now he goes into a, this, this more detailed spirit. Uh, as does St. Paul, who says, whatever things I may do and have not love, I am nothing. But I, he says, extol detachment above any love. First, because at best, love constrains me to love God. Zum ersten darum, weil das Gute an der Liebe ist, dass sie mich zwingt, Gott zu lieben. God, it, love forces me to love God. Nun ist es viel mehr wert, dass ich Gott zu mir zwinge, als dass ich mich zu Gott zwinge. But it is worth much more that I force myself, that I force God to come to me, compel God to me, uh, literally, uh, as that I force myself to God. And that's of course, here you can see why that is a radical statement. Too. So, um, after this short introduction in which the whole process is, as it were, laid out, you now get in the text, by looking at love, humility, empathy, you get an explanation of what he has gone through. And an emptying out of love, of humility, of empathy, leading to the point where the soul, the, exist the existing subject, is emptied out and it becomes so empty, he says, that nothing can survive there except God. All things, that only something as delicate as God can survive in this nothingness in, at the heart of the soul. And he basically goes through the, goes through the whole text like that. Yeah? Um, 
Um, I thought it was an interesting um, relationship between, you might say, determinism and freedom here, isn't there? Like, he talks about forcing God to love him. Yeah. Um, and yet the way that he wants to do that is by creating a situation in which <coughs> he is free for nothing but that love. Yeah. It's, it's a strange... I think, yes, it seems strange to use the word swinging in this. Yeah. In this film. Exactly. That's another example of what I want to draw attention to the fact that there are unresolvable contradictions in the text that, without affirming a, a, a rigid logic of history, over centuries lead to the dissolution of the idea of God. Yeah? Precisely because of that. I think. Mm -hmm. Because these are not the kind of contradictions that um, that, that that retain a sense of of the eternal truth. No, they, they just become impossible. Uh, he also says, this is on page four of the text that was sent around. God ever stands in his talks about praying. What's the point of praying? And he says, there's no point in praying. Uh, uh, God. Um, uh, so God is also detached, and whatever, you, what your, whatever your prayers are, it's not going to have any effect. And he has a story about how everything's already decided anyway. But, but then he says, does God ever stand in his immovable detachment? And yet the prayers and good works of people are not wasted, for he who does well will be rewarded, and he who does evil will reap accordingly. Uh, but if he's just said that everything has already been fixed, so you see again how he is struggling with, with the contradiction that he can't, he can't come out of it based on the same uh, starting point. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah. About the Zwingen, uh, I'm sorry, not so sure if I would agree with this deterministic reading there simply because it depends how you read this Zwingen relates to what. Because the reaching the state of an Abgeschiedenheit is of course a struggle for the person who uh, embarks on the journey. And uh, at the same time, it, uh, Eckhart would say um, that the moment that you have absolute emptiness means, uh, Reinheit means there's nothing else um, but a space where only God could survive. Yeah. This singing could also uh, I'm not so sure that it might be a forced reading, but the thing could also point to, I mean, God to me as thing could also mean that, that he is explaining with this thing in the struggle of the project of, um, of, of, of Abgeschiedenheit, of reaching a Reinheit, and as sort of a natural phenomenon, in this Reinheit only God can be. So it's basically pushing other things out rather than pushing other things in. And that's what the Tsingen... That's how I would yeah. think. I um, my, would my sort of image in my head was that by the time he um, emptied out his soul, um, the, the Tsingen, it wasn't so much determinism, but rather um, a kind of, I don't know um, how to describe it really, but kind of a force of attraction whereby, um, you know, only I don't know, like, like opening something and then water running into the space below, that kind of yes. thing. And so not sort of a teleological determinism, but rather more like a natural force yes. or something yes. like that. He does say that, and he, he, he draws on Aristotle without mentioning it, but he says everything strives after its natural place. Yes. Yeah. And, then, and then he says, so and, and God wants to be in me. Yeah. Yes. And so, so kind of you create a vacuum yeah. and you open yeah. it up and but, then but, and then then it it's, Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, but That's that, how I imagine it. Yeah. But that is, of course, also an exquisite heresy <laughs> to say, you know, everything strives after its natural place, also God. Yeah. yeah? That is, in, in terms of, we talked last time about classical, classical uh, theology, that is a, that's a total heresy because God is precisely in a place where he doesn't have to move. Like God is on the top of the mountain and wherever, whichever way he moves, he, he goes down. So he, he has to stay there. It's the other things that want to become like God and that, that move to what is natural for them, want to move to what's natural for them, which is their closest approximation to the to the to the, the rest, the, the, the perfect rest with itself, with itself that God is. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
I'm not sure what kind of doing the kind of the radicality of theology here, because it wasn't of course Spinoza who was condemned in the 18th century for denying uh, purposes to God. Um, so you um, can't have both Eckhart being condemned for denying purposes to God. Um, and it's been on the yeah, it's the most important yeah. one, so okay, sure. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'm having a purpose and I'm moving, yeah. so using a category from natural philosophy to say that's what God is doing when he comes in, into my soul. God well, moves in mysterious ways, so we uh, <laughs> Yeah, he moves in mysterious ways. Yeah, okay, okay. Maybe I don't want to stress it, but... But, yeah. but I think you're no. right. I mean, in a way, he is going on, on two tracks here. On one hand, he is sort of talking of God as in terms of the unbewegte Vega, as, uh, but at the same time he makes the unbewegte Vega um, part of the process that it creates and therefore makes God a, an element of nature as you would describe and that, and that is quite correct, I would, I would fully agree with you. So, so in, in that way he basically says this is how we define God and I suppose with that he is completely um, um, on a on a par with, with what what has been uh, the, the the idea at the time, but I think the radicality of that is that he applies that notion of his, this definition to God itself, mm -hmm. um, which which I believe yeah. is and, and, and with that exactly, and what happens with that, and then you can now you can see so Feuerbach was a, was a great reader of Eckhart, uh, uh, there you see in a way when he says so I think you should read this thus. Um, that's ich Gott zu mir zwinge, that you can read that as not as he meaning it, but you can read it in it. I become God. Yeah. Or so so the the court deus homo, why does God become man? That's the whole point of let's say atheism from, from Feuerbach to, to Ernst Bloch, is this idea that that we that, that, that we become God, Eritis Sibudeus, we will become like God, snakes as in paradise. Uh, and that's precisely what, what the atheism, Marxist atheism from Feuerbach to Bloch takes almost literally, as it were. We become God. Ich zwinge Gott zu mir. That's, I think, the, 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 where you can, I don't say Eckhart meant that, but you can see how you can how you can see it in that light, and then you begin to see how this notion of subjectivity as detachment, as pure anything out, leads to this idea that 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 the distinction between God and and and, and, and the, the natural world is collapsed. Mm -hmm. Not in the way that's I think the that, that's for later on. Not not in the way in which um, we say there is no God and it's all quarks and electrons. But in the way in which that which religion has, has spoken about, this what Berger calls this hunger, hunger in, in being, which goes much further than material hunger, is actually something that belongs in a radically immanentist project rather than in a, mm -hmm. uh, in a, in a transcendentalist project. You say well, that? I, I think this is against the other thoughts. I mean, surely Feuerbach and the Westphalian proto atheism there's a very strong sense that we become God, and, you know, we know who we are, and uh, the very strong sense of who we is. With with Eckhart here, there's, there's the conversely in the sense that um, that I become God in, 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 through the negation of myself, and that's that's much more like uh, standard uh, anti-humanist mysticism, um, uh, and doesn't seem to be something which easily translates into the kind of the back in humanism which you're describing. Yes, but Feuerbach also also has room for the idea that we don't know yet who we are, and and that and 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 certainly in the Marxist version. We have no idea what the communist society will look like. We don't know what sort of things we will be there. What sort of, yeah. Well, um, um, but of course, but I, I see that that is a that is a that is a good point. But, but doesn't he talk about the ground of the soul? So, so God is not really uh, coming or going. He is the ground of the soul, uh, and it is a journey of discovery of that ground of the soul. So I, I do become one with God. This God is not really at some distance and he's I'm coming to summon him. Side me or to her is the ground of the soul. Yeah. Well, so these journeys which she in this on the novelty he gives us six stages. Yeah. Where he actually gets rid of all sorts 
and you are you just faced with this emptiness yeah. completely, which is that's where the ground of the soul, yeah. which is the abyss or the desert or yeah. several metaphors that people come across in mysticism. Because um, there is an idea in, in Islamic mysticism, some of it, not all of it, that we are the outside of, of what God is the inside. Uh, we are in God, and He's the outside of us. And then we, God becomes the inside of us, and we are the outside of, you know, of God. So it's sort of uh, perverse yeah. process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, I, the yeah. journey, which uh, say the mystic like Ibn Arabi in the 12th, 13th century, just before I thought, he talked several times about he actually had spiritual journey and he described even cosmology things he went through but then at the end of it he said and i discovered that all this journey is in myself yeah so of course I mean, that's you that, yeah, but that you could read that also in atheism yeah you say it's all just within myself i.e there is no goal it's it's me it's but you can also read it in a theological traditional theological way saying i god is inside me yeah and i'm just pointing out that here textually there are moments where the text begins to slip in a way in which this later atheist version becomes almost you can almost see it mm. see it forming there i'm not saying that that is what i got meant to say but you can see it in the text yeah and that's um i, I, I really can see things in that manner if we are reading it in a philosophical fashion then, then the issues do present themselves uh, in ways which suggest that they're subsequent resolution, but it isn't a part of Eckhart's possible intent in writing these texts to um, uh, provoke and puzzle the reader by, by the kind of paradoxical and hypothetical way he develops his ideas. So we can take them as a yeah. as a problem, but you know, precisely as a kind of uh, an index of its truth. I think that is certainly true for I mean we would require you could also do a whole a whole session of sex seminars just on that text. But I think it's certainly true for some of the rhetorical moves that he makes like in the beginning, but I think he, he loses control of himself in the text. You could always read it in a constructive way. Um, there are points where it does where that doesn't work. And that's where it becomes interesting. And one of this is this word swing. Yeah. But I, mean, I think it's true that Eckhart's at the beginning of this process, but um, I think what happens with the religious texts, you know, up until you know the early modern period is that writers increasingly lose control of what they're saying. Um, and and if, you, if you look at someone like Montaigne, for example, you know, biographers seem to think that he was a, you know, a good Catholic. But if you read the essays, it's, it's full of unambiguous heresies. And I, but I don't think Montaigne would describe himself as an atheist. And you, you could say the same thing about Francis Bacon. There's, there's, there are tendencies in his texts which are unsayable at that point. I mean, they become unsayable. I mean, in some like Hobbes, it's fairly. Yeah. You know, one ambiguous. He's an atheist. Yeah. But before then, it was very difficult to say this. Yeah. And so you find very strange. And, and I think a lot of this has to do simply with the, uh, with, with the fact of printing. Um, I mean, if you look at the history of printing, I mean, uh, at some point, yeah. books become exponential. Yeah. And, and fewer of them are religious texts or strict. And the, the texts become more and more secular. And there's just the proliferation of books by themselves. You know, many, many even a, a divine like you know Robert Burton. I mean, reason like the anatomy of melancholy. It's it's actually co corrosive, destructive nonsense. Yeah. It's somebody yeah. being over. You know, it's, it's there in Hamlet as well. It's an obviously. I think I mean, this is one of the. Oh God, yeah. I was going to say also the language. I mean, you know, writing in vernacular languages was not terribly prevalent at this time. You know, this kind yeah. of material. So. The way in which we talk about the word Zwingen, for example, I mean, um, the, the etymology of that word, you know, is, 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 is another question, but, um, you know, the way in which Eckhart is using German, I think, is, is, is interesting. It's a creative act itself, you know, using German in this way, so. Yeah, well, that, be, that is true. He's not to that when, when he's using language in the way, he's using control. But that's that, that seems to be, you know, to, to, to suppose that there's an attempt to kind of put forward a kind of philosophical argument which it looks starts to look paradoxical or contradictory then it's losing control. But is that necessarily the right way to read texts like these? Which are meant to give you some sort of striking 
how lots of ideas do Yeah, I think, I, I'm saying there are distracting paradoxical ideas, but there's also something in it where he loses control. Right. And, and, and that, is the, that is where these words like, don't really work anymore. Yeah? Um, but what you want is that you pick on Zwingli, and so something that, that, that it is in the paradox and, and peculiar for many of the reasons discussed, but, but why isn't that the point? Rather than, rather than being an index of that, a line of thought, train of thought, running uh, out of uh, Eckhart's hands. Because it ultimately leads to a dissolution of the idea of God. Oh, that, that, that seems to be a theological philosophy of history, isn't it? You know, because could we go from here to Feuerbach, then that's, that's how we should make sense of this. But that's maybe the map, I think, what came from Feuerbach to, to read these texts. But again, it seems anachronistic, theological, potentially. Yeah, okay, well, you know, yeah, that's, that's a really big question. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know if, I don't want to refer to sort of, as I've already said, the strict logic of history uh, in, in these texts. And, but I don't, I don't say that it's quite like Burma, you know, simply by virtue of being kind of identified, uh, not Burma, sorry, I can't, simply by virtue of being, you know, identifiably German, yeah. is kind of anticipating Protestantism in, in yeah. ways which may be Thomas Aquinas yeah. or well, was not. I mean, and, I think was that is, and I think that is true, but I do want to point, I do want to defend that. Yeah, I just want to say it's not that. So I think what you, so this, this, this something in the text that's that's working and that cannot come out. That is precisely again an example of the unthought in thought. That is precisely another example of what I mean by materialism. You can call it here historical materialism, or whatever it is. But there is something, as you said, that cannot be said, but it's working there. And later on, we may see a little bit of what it is. And this seems to me to be, well, that seems to be, to be, and you can also see it in the, without going too much into historical materialist view of, of, of textual production, but the fact that Eckhart wrote in Cologne is not uh, insignificant, which is the place where there was also a strong, the origin of a strong culture of, of lay mysticism. And, and one of the, 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 the hotbeds of the, 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 the peasant the development league, the peasant revolution. So the idea that, and this, that he starts to write in German has got a lot to do with the fact that there was brewing a kind of an uprise against authoritarian structures in the church fed by a mystical understanding of the relation between the human being and God. I think that is just, just quite clear that it happened that way. I would, I would be willing, come from that idea now, we would willing to go one step further and say, it's not coincidence that this happens on a, in a city on the Rhine, because uh, just as, the, as the, the printing of books is important, that uh, this was the main transportation uh, channel through, through Northern Europe uh, at that time. Later on, printing will, uh, this will, will spread out over Europe via the cities along the Rhine. And humanism travels along the line from Italy to, 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 to the, the low countries. Yeah? So I think that there's a, the word free thinker, Freigeist, originates at the time of Eckhart in Cologne. So I think these things do have a, yeah, they do play a role. Yeah? Although you can't reduce a text to that. Um, no, I also think that it's right. What means is that obviously you can't read from the point of view of Eckhart writing this, you can't read uh, these ideas teleologically, but retrospectively, mm. you can see that Eckhart's writing stands in a tradition of, of literature and thought from which others have taken and interpreted. And so from the point at which we interpret it, there is a certain yeah. um, thread yeah. that you don't want to yeah. speak about a goal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can't say that Feuerbach is prefigured in Eckhart, but now that Feuerbach has been there, and you look back and you see, yeah, exactly, there is something there. It doesn't, that's not a teleology that works itself out in deterministic, uh, deterministic fashion. Um, A nobleman went away to a distant country and gained a kingdom for himself and returned. For Eckhart, normal superficial reading, what we've just been talking about, he speaks here of this. He 
it in the value of the God, these, these steps, which are steps of emptying out. Overcoming the senses, overcoming that, overcoming that, overcoming the body, and, and that is the process of um, going away to a distant country to gain a kingdom in which you return to, to, to the unity between God and man that was there before creation. In a more immanentist logic, you could say, you could say, oh well, this is uh, the idea of um, going out of yourself to create a world in which you are at home. So the project of creating a human world, creating a, uh, as Bloch would say, a Heimat, which is a process of creation. The subject comes to recognize itself, be at home in the object. The identity between subject and object is established as the, the substance, as the identity between subject and object is established as the identity of in Hegel, absolute spirit. A certain no one went away to a distant country, went out of himself to gain a kingdom, and returned to himself. Can be read as a process of getting rid of things in order to come, come back to an original state, or can be read as the process of creating a space in which something that was never there, but which can always be understood as a return, can be, can be affirmed. Um, and it is for Eckhart, the inner man, who does that. It is the, the subject. Just as in self-consciousness, you are self-conscious because you are aware of something that is not us. That makes us aware of ourselves. Huh? Yeah, I want to say something. Oh. Can I ask a question? Why? About, about the first text of Eckhart, uh, about what I see as a tension but not necessarily a contradiction. And I'm not quite sure if, 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 if that is perhaps right or not. Um, the, perhaps reducing the text into the, the, the reason why we as humans are able to um, compel God to us is because we are a product of His. Could one say that? This is just one of the steps that I want to make in order to go to the tension that I see. So the, the ability that human beings have for up the sheet height and therefore attain the point of absolute purity where only God can exist and hence we, we basically create God in us through that process. That is, as I sort of see this imminent in the text, because we are a product of God. Um, and therefore he can also reconstruct this element of of, 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 of that is the point where we perhaps get close to God or become God in, in, in us um, in a way. Um, the, the question that I'm not quite sure how this tension works is why in the end has God created that world? Um, so in a way God is by definition purity, is yeah. by definition, um, and, and purity is what you would then define as a moment. Yeah. Um, and, and that is a, a, an element that can also be nourished from us, um, um, but at the same time, that means a, a giving up of that world that is being created by God. Yeah. Um, so why did they create it in the first place? Well, why is that a stupid question? But um, but how can this tension be resolved? Perhaps is a better question. No. I mean, he does say that that God has no intention whatsoever in the God uh, in the world that he created. Yeah. But then my question would be: Is 
perhaps the creation of the world, sort of the materialization of his Vernunft uh, that, that he would have uh, mentioned earlier. I'm not quite sure how, how, how one deals with this tension that there is. On the one hand, we understand God because we are made by him. Um, God, as by definition, is purity, is Abgeschiedenheit, is Reinheit. But at the same time, there's also this, this, this element of constructing the world um, that then is, is so unabgeschieden, as it were. Um, I'm not sure. No, I think this is, of course, I think this is the heart of this problem is form of evil. So why, why, why is there infection in, in the world at all? And if God is responsible for it, and why is he created uh, this, 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 this creaturely world that goes out of God in order to return to him? And um, so I think that that is what lies behind it, and it's always been a struggle for, for the medieval uh, philosophers and theologians to make sense of this idea of God as a sage us, as be as as in itselfness, without relation, uh, and yet the idea of the creation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the uh, again in the long process this this confrontation between a, a Greek view of perfection as as you know detached in the sense of not being re related or, or affected by anything and the the, the judeo-christian notion of god as the one who, ha who has a concern with the world is one of the things that that leads to this explosion that we see prefigured here and that is modernity so i think that is a very important point and i think hegel tries to solve this in a logical philosophical sense by saying yeah uh, if God is perfect purity, unity, that means he's infinity, but of course the infinite is only truly infinite if there's nothing outside of it, so it has to go outside of itself, it, it has to go through the finite as it were in order to become truly infinite, it has to, be, it has to, it has to include its own negation within itself, that's the whole point of the, of the logic. Um, and that's, a, that's almost a way, you know, that's Hegel's answer to this problem. Here you can, you can see it prefigured in, in exactly the same way as the point about Feuerbach earlier. I think that how I would want in, in the materialist history, in, in the history of materialism in German thought, I would like to say, you said Eckhart uh, writes about, uh, he says, we, we are produced by God. That's what you said. What it is, yeah? I, I think that the, 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 the real message of this text is God is produced by us. Um, um, but at the same time, I, I think it's both ways. Yeah, okay, you say it's both ways, but I think, of course, I would, I would accept that, but I think that's the, the place it has in an idea of materialism, is, is that that idea becomes, becomes operative in, in the thought of, of, of Eckhart. Um, in, in a way that is not the same, maybe that's important to add, and then we go to Bergen, in a way that is not the same as um, Epicurus or Lucretius, who had already said in antiquity, the gods are our invention. Why we, we create the gods because we are afraid of things. Uh, which is, of course, also a very important point. But Eckhart doesn't say that. There is a depth, that's what I started out by saying. There is a certain depth in his view of, of subjectivity of the human person that, that means you cannot get rid of God as easily as that. And I think that is again. Um, a typical feature for the, the German tradition of materialism that culminates later on in, in, in some parts of the 20th century. This idea that there is, um, you know, it's let, let, let's say there is a German version of material of atheism and there is a Dawkins version of atheism and they have to, they set them on meat. And that has to do with this point. That's what makes myself clear. Um, well, the third one, the Eckhart's point, seems to put quite clearly um, in the second page, paragraph 7, of what Hegel mentioned, with the way he developed this idea of God's seed, God's seed being in us, and reason being God's seed. Um, and he says that the, that the seed of the nut tree grows into a nut tree, um, and God's seed grows into God. So, that's precisely that point that we are. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah. The point yeah. about development is to become God, so there is that. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good point. He also says that's the last thing we said. Page sixty gives this definition of the novel or explanation. Novel because he is one, and because he knows God and creatures in the one. So it's like the circle of yeah. God the creation and through my consciousness and, and consciousness of God and 
we in all the world as well. Yeah. We need to warm up. Yes. Warm up. Okay. Page two, paragraph seven. Yeah. yeah. So it's like God externalized himself. Yeah. Into us in the world. Yeah. But it's through man that man figures out the world cycle. Yeah. And find that it's in the one that's. Yeah. That's it's in the noble man who will. Yeah. In Islamic mysticism, they call him the perfect man. Yeah. And it's in this perfect man who figures it out that we. Yeah, exactly. Oh, right. that's, and he's part of the story. Yeah. And, and that's also in Hegel, of course. Yeah. Because you can say, yeah, absolute spirit, but it's Hegel who writes the book, as it were. Uh, yeah. that's, <laughs> that is a, that's a real point. That's a point that the mystics have always taken up. God, as Angelo Silesius says, the, 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 the 18th century German uh, uh, mystic poet, without me, God cannot live one moment. Yeah, that's, uh, that is the point here. Um, Okay, very good. He also says, I just want to say that, this word human, he says, yeah, uh, mensch in, in Latin uh, 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 derives from humus, from uh, earth, from the earth. So man, the, the, the human, the, 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 the human being, is the one who is uh, the earthling, so the, uh, the, one who, uh, the one who comes out of the, of the soil and goes back to it. And that, of course, oh, yeah. Hmm? Adam. Adam. Yeah. Ah, Adam. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, I just wanted to point that out. Okay. So then we, then we. There's, of course, much more, as I said, to be said about this. It's not the point to, to exhaustively discuss our text, but just to, to place them in, in a, to see what materialist motives are, and how we can, by looking at that, also understand what materialist motives are in a, in a slightly less way. Um, we're going to move to uh, to Bebe. Do you, do you want a five minute break or? It's just one minute. Yeah, exactly. Let's just go on now. Yeah. Um, so, what I've said is, I, I, I chose these two thinkers to, um, to point on the one hand to the notion of subjectivity that will become very important in our understanding of materialism, and on the other hand to look at this dynamic notion of materialism and this dialectical notion of matter. And one of the first... Uh, that, that, that is this text, yeah. Which is, it's not, it's not it's this cutting off the... Uh, no. uh, model. Okay. Uh, how do I do this? Straight to zoom to 100, not that it works, it's on 155. Yeah, okay. yeah, Can you read it? Yeah. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very close. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what if I do it like this? I have a feeling that I could be completely wrong about the participants here, but I have a feeling that most of you are more comfortable in English. It's fine, not for us. It's fine, not for us. Yeah, for you, but not if you sit on that side. Oh. Then we have only the English. That's okay, yeah? Good. No, we're not going to go through all the text, but we'll do it some fragments. So this is a, 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 a text that I do not know very much about, I must say. Morgen wird ihr im Aufgang die Wurzel oder Mutter der Philosophie, Astrologie und Theologie aus rechten Gründen und die Beschreibung der Natur, wie alles gewesen und im Anfang worden ist. That wonderful language wie die Natur und Elementa kreatürlich worden sind, auch von beiden Qualitäten, Bösen und Guten, woher alle Dinge seinen Ursprung hatten, wie es jetzt steht und wird und wie es am Ende dieser Zeit werden wird. Auch wie Gottes und der Herr Leib geschaffen ist und wie die Menschen in jedes kreatürlich wirken. Alles aus rechtem Grunde und Erkenntnis des Geistes von dem Wahlen Gottes mit Fleiß gestellt durch Jakob Böhme in Görlitz im Jahr Christi 12 seines Alters 37. Jahres. Dies klingt dem gedruckt, ja, das ausgeborenen Heils und Kontrast. 
marvelous, eh, to, to title like that. <laughs> um, so this is a, a book, of course, was very, was, uh, as you know, a cobbler um, who, uh, who, who wrote uh, theosophical texts, um, which, which became quite well known. Uh, for a while, he was known generally as the Philosophus Tertonicus, the, the, the German thinker. He was actually more popular in England under the name of German thinker in the early days after his death, his first century of his reception, then in Germany itself. Um, Hegel contrasts him with Bacon. He says that these are the two uh, writing at the same time, the birth of the technical, scientific, and empirical spirit and the birth of speculative reason, because that's what happens in Böhme. And um, Marx was very, um, uh, uh, was an admirer of Böhme precisely because of this dialectical thinking that we find here. And I think that was an important uh, thing for us in understanding the history of materialism. Böhme was a, a, so was a, was a shoemaker, I mean, people have sometimes exaggerated the, the extent of his, uh, of his uh, simplicity. He had quite a nice big house in the center of, uh, of, of Görlitz, and he was also a uh, sort of four-story house. So I think he had like a, he, he must have had at one point a, a workshop, maybe even employing people and things like that. Um, uh, and he, uh, he, uh, he, he was also at a point quite well known for his writings until at some point uh, he got an order from, from the bishop to stop writing, uh, which he then also maintained for 10 years, and then he started to, to write again. Um, he didn't really get into a lot of trouble for what he said, so there wasn't that aspect of it, but there was a sense of what he was saying is not entirely orthodox, and, and he also for a while stopped writing. He had no formal training, and um, uh, but he must have had read a lot because the, the text is full of references, full of very classical top oil in, uh, in, uh, in, in Renaissance thought. So he must have had access to quite a few things, I think. Um, he had an experience, so, okay, the, this is his first book, Morgen wird im Aufgang, Aurora, the, the Morning Sky. Um, and he says in his text that why he's given it this title is, is a mystery, something that he's not telling us. And that those who are sufficiently simple-minded can understand it. But it is, it is, uh, uh, it is a bit of uh, an insight that is precluded to the, or that is, that is, that is prohibited to the wise and the learned. So uh, that's a question that we can talk about. What does that mean? Um, I, of course, uh, as you don't have to, to point out to you that Nietzsche also published a book with the title Morgan Goethe. So there's something there maybe that we can think about. And also, so also so you've asked us to put in phrase of folly. I mean, it's, I mean, it seems to be an, an idea that was kind of in the air at this time. I mean, maybe clever people writing books about how great it is to be stupid. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yes, yeah, 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 of course, yeah, 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 yeah. great, this is stupid, yeah, 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 that's right, yeah, and of course we just have seen the detachment, the same kind of thing, yeah, uh, but um, does that, does it also be right about Aurora, no? Well, well no, I'm just, I'm just in, in terms of the theme of, uh, the, the, uh, I mean, I'm mean, in the simple room. Yeah, 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 of course, that's, yeah. that's quite a familiar uh, thing, yeah, yeah, but with, with what he means by the, by the, the morning dawn. Why that becomes? We talked about it last time a little bit. Uh, also, mind you, the, 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 the what was it? The Gallic cock. Yeah. Marx yeah, talking sure. about. Uh, yeah. Uh, so there is a, there is an idea that we need to look at. As you may know, if not, I'll tell you. Böhme had a again a mystical experience, um, which is the start of his writing and thinking. And that actually connects exactly to the last point we discussed um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, Eckhart. Um, he, uh, he, 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 he describes how he, he was working uh, on making shoes. And I don't know if you've ever seen it, but in, uh, making shoes requires very good eyesight and it's very sort of, uh, uh, miniature work. Um, and it requires a lot of light. And so how, in the old days, they created strong magnified, uh, strong magnified beam of light is by having a, um, a cool a, a bowl filled with water through which uh, the light of the candle falls and then it gets sort of 
concentrated and you, you get a really bright light. Yeah? So that's a very beautiful instrument that, uh, that um, Böhme also had in his workshop. And it casts also light on, on the wall and, and around uh, itself. Um, so he was working, you can imagine, in, a, in an atmosphere in which light and dark were always present in a very pronounced way. It was a dark workshop and a patch of light while there's work going on. And um, he describes how, how there is, uh, at one point, uh, when he was working, there was a tin plate hanging on the wall. And he saw the light of the lamp shining on the tin plate and saw something that you can sometimes see, that the light reflected from the plate, but the plate remained dark. Um, it's also something that you can see if you get an old the vinyl uh, uh, album, <laughs> like, a, like a, a record. If you look at it, you look at it, you can, you can see a, 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 it, it mirrors. You can see a perfect reflection of itself. It's going on with all the colors, but the, the record itself is dark, and the, the material is black. Um, so he, he saw that, uh, and then he said he realized that light requires darkness for it to be seen. So light requires something that is not visible, that is not lit, uh, for it to be seen. And um, that became for him the principle of his entire thinking, that something requires its negation, for it to be. You can easily see how, why uh, uh, Hegel says that speculative thinking starts with Böhme, and you can also easily see why um, Marx found that this a very important uh, uh, insight. Um, and he, uh, so he had that experience, and out of that came a whole series of writings in which he applies this idea of a logic of opposites that require each other to a description of the place of man in the world, a reinterpretation of, of, of Christ, the Christian world in which he was living. Um, and he adds to it an account of matter as a dynamic force. The, 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 the principle along which matter develops is that of this logic of oppositions. There is what he calls as Böse and as Gute, the good, the bad, and the good. The good requires the bad in order to be. Um, and in this way, the world develops. The, the, whole, the whole world develops the forms that it has, and so do we. God becomes an element in that process. He, like, he starts this text by saying, the whole world is like a tree, and, uh, and, and we are the fruits on the tree. And God is the, the zaft, the, the juice that, that pumps through the tree. That's, so, so God becomes an element in a story about how the world develops, yeah, as it were. Um, go to the same a bit more about the original. So the, 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 the principle along which nature, as Mark Paul works, is that of the logical sort of positions. And what happens in nature is that um, things emerge. He calls this quellen, to quell, to quell up. And he connects etymologically, they of course have got nothing to do with each other, the word quellen, or quelle, source, to, to quell, with qualität, quality. Yeah? Some people say it's because they didn't know that Quelle is spelled with two L's and quality is spelled with one L because he always mixes that up. And this is a, a this is a, 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 an edited text that we have here, but he, he spells quality usually with two L's. Quality, and then he says, and then he goes from, from quality to, to quality to quality. <coughs> so um, to emerge, you might say. Huh? So nature is a process of emergence according to a dialectical logic of oppositions. And that's a really big idea um, because, um, as I said, he makes God uh, an, an, an element in that process rather than that which orchestrates the whole thing. Um, and then he has, he has a, so he says this, he, he, use, he, he draws back, he, he falls back on, on uh, on alchemy, he falls back on, uh, on all sorts of mystical traditions, 
Um, so he uses the, the, the theory of the four elements of air, fire, uh, earth, and water, but he also uses the four qualities of um, bitter, süß, bitter, sour, herbe, sweet, bitter, uh, what's that sour? Uh, sour. Sour and uh, salt. So these are the tastes. Um, and, he, and he explains in the text how these are themselves in relation to oppositions. They arise out of each other and they need each other. And particularly the, the das Herbe, salt, is an important one because it's not in this text, but somewhere else he says that, um, well, he says that the, 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 this quellen is related to an experience of, 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 uh, of drive and things. The world wants to go somewhere. And so the world, and so the creatures or beings experience themselves as being in a state of hunger. They are not where they, where they should be, but they do not have what they, what they, what they want to have. So there is movement. Yeah? And his hunger is in a way a will. Yeah? And he says that when this will realizes that it's not being satisfied, it turns back on itself. It becomes aware of itself as will. And he says that is the element of salt. Uh, and that is the element of um, Das, that, that's das Herbe. You can almost see a connection to the biblical notion of the soul of the earth, of course, because this is consciousness. And he says that is the origin of light. So the origin of light is hunger becoming aware of itself. Now, don't need more <laughs> Marxist, uh, you can't find more Marxist statement than Marx, can you? Uh, hunger becoming aware of itself is the source of light. Um, I think, uh, uh, so we're going to go and look at the text now for a little bit, just in terms of how this relates. Leibniz was a big reader of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Böhme, who was, I think, the first real admirer of the sort of tradition of Böhme. And um, I think that um, we could say that, that Leibniz's notion of, of subjectivity, if we inter interpret it in the Lewisian lines as a fold, uh, go goes back to this, this moment of, of, of hunger hunger feeling back, striking back on itself. Um, yeah, that's general. The, yeah. The, I thought it was fascinating, partly because there's a lot of linguistic materialism, which um, uh, you know, the Kerlin and Carl type of related. In fact, he makes it a more um, the radical suggestion, doesn't he? Uh, and wants to connect Kerlin to Kvam, um, and Kvam, torment and anguish. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. Um, yeah. Um, which is a book kind of this little dissension at the heart of that which then emerges as a result of its internal yeah. sort of uh, opposition, and then that's manifest as the qualities of things. Yeah, and that's the hunger and the yeah. Yeah, exactly. but, but, but yeah. it comes up even in chapter one. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Early on, um, um, the translator has some from that kind of makes sense of uh, that yeah. way. But, um, so it's, 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 it's astonishing, it's sort of uh, dynamic and dramatic, but the way he gets all this, this out of it is this uh, subtle play with the words. Yeah, it's quite amazing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a long text. So I've given you only a little bit to read. Um, Okay, let's, let's just look at, at, at the beginning of the, of, of the text of this, of this metaphor of the tree. And he says already, I'll just read a little bit. Uh, ich vergleiche die ganze Philosophie am Astrologie, am Theologie, am Music and Latin Words, samt ihrer Mutter einem köstlichen Baum, der in einem schönen Lustgarten wächst. I compare the whole of philosophy, astrology and theology together the matter to a goodly tree whose growth in a fair ground pleasure. That already is um, talking about materialist gestures is a kind of affirmation of creation in it. Saying the world is a good place. 
I recall to mind the opening section of Lucretius de Reo Natura, which begins in a similar vein with uh, a prayer to, 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 the, to, the, to Venus, the goddess of love. It's the same kind of thing, same kind of exalting description of nature, which we find here in one sentence there in a whole uh, poem. Um, but an attitude, attitude that's actually quite similar to the one that we find in, uh, in, in, in Francis Bacon, uh, which uh, Marx says in, in Bacon, uh, the Bloch uh, always quotes this, uh, the, the world, the material world looks at us with a, with a benevolent smile, something like that. The world smiles at us in, in Francis Bacon. And here the world also smiles at us. But isn't there a small difference? I mean, it's, it's the, the world that we have created in our minds. I mean, it's philosophiam, astrologiam, theologiam. Um, it's, it's basically the ideas uh, that, that are beautiful, um, not so much the world, perhaps. Um, what am I mistaken here? Yeah. Well, it's used in Baltimore metaphors, and however, I mean, it's a poem by Andrew Marvel, where the garden, it's all about withdrawal from sexual pleasures, you know, green thoughts and a green shade. And you actually read the poem, the, the metaphors he uses are sexual metaphors, so this. There's a, I mean, there's a real tension there. I mean, you say you want to get away from the world and express the wonders of transcendent physicality in, in, in a physical way. Um, and I think maybe something like that is going on with uh, Burma as well. I mean, I mean, it does kind of pay lip service to the uh, dualism of, um, uh, you know, of Eckhart and, but um, he's so relentlessly physical in his, in his metaphors that um, it, it can't work that way. No, so I, I think um, uh, I think actually yes. Yeah. So he is he is saying you can think of of the the, the, the so this is this Renaissance today the idea that the, the, the world the way you think about the world is the same as the way you think about the human being. There is a there is a parallel, is it? and that a human life can be thought of as a, as a tree growing. Bearing fruit, uh, it needs to have soil, it needs to have roots, and then it, it bears fruit and uh, is a process. And so it is with the world. Um, it's not a metaphor, it's actually, and that's I think the answer to the question, it's an autonomy. It's a metonymic relationship, not a metaphoric relationship. Um, the great, great and forgotten American rhetorician, Kenneth Burke, has written a beautiful text about this for master tropes, in which he says that the, the, the fundamental met metonymy is that of the relation between the, is the, the, the microcosmos and the macrocosmos. And that is uh, what was going on here. It's not a metaphor, it's a metonymic relationship. And so what applies to the, he says indeed, that's absolutely true, uh, that the, I, I compare philosophy, astrology, theology to a, to a, to a tree. Um, so that's about ideas, exactly, yeah, as we said. But then, just on the next page, it says, uh, number eight, uh, what, I, what I've tried to indicate is that this tree is actually the world. Um, eight to seven. Eight, eight to seven. Now, observe that I've signified that this similitude, the garden of this tree signifies the world, the soil, the mold signifies nature, the stock of the tree signifies the stars by the branches among the elements. The fruit which grow on these trees signify men. The sap in the tree denotes the pure deity. Now man who made out the nature of the stars and elements of God creator reigns in all, even as the sap and dust in the whole tree. So uh, just as we saw with, with Eckhart where, where God and man is a relation of internal externality, external internality between the two, it's the same here. Um, and that already indicates that uh, a kind of thought in which you understand the material reality as built, as made up out of small building blocks, the combination of which then creates higher, higher levels, whether with the emerging properties or not, is not exactly the kind of world in which we are here. That's not the world of, of Burma. You get in Burma, you get the repetition of what you get on, as it were, on each level on each other, on the other level, just as. My, I can compare my life to the tree, 
fell or rolled to a true tree. It's, and that is why it's a metonymic relationship or it's, it's a synagogic relationship rather than a, than a metaphorical one. Yeah, when you said that this is similar to the inner and outer man that we'd seen in Echo, surely it's very different because there's, a, there's this platonic idea of the inner and outer man as, as being two really quite different sort of, sorts of things, whereas here the good and evil penetrates absolutely everything with all these yeah, 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 all yeah, these yeah, levels. Yeah. So it, that's what makes this so different. Than this that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's very different. Absolutely, yeah. And that's, of course, yeah. Uh, no, what, what I meant was you get here also the idea that that um, what, what we discussed in, in, in Eckhart, that in the end, so God is inside me and I'm inside God. Yeah. Um, that you have, you have that here too, but but you're absolutely yeah. right. Because here say, again, God is in fact. Yeah. It's, he's discovered that God is everywhere, isn't he? Yeah. Do you have to have nothing yeah. for God no. to be there? Yeah. And God is there yeah. where all this other this yeah. fullness, this fullness here, rather yeah. than yeah, 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 yeah. emptiness. Yes, and of course the outer world for Eckhart is the world of of decay, is creation, is what should go away. Whereas here, that's why I said it starts with uh, an exaltation of the material world. Mm -hmm. It's that absolutely not the case. And so we must not let ourselves be misled by the fact that the classical image of the tree is used here. You know, actually, it is. Uh, it is not. It, it's a fractal view of, uh, of of nature and the relation between nature and man, and the between God and man and nature. It's the same pattern repeating itself at, at, at different levels of, magn of, of magnification, as it were. Now, so it's. Uh, I think, huh? because of course it's very easy if you. And if you, if you use the image of the tree to think, oh, you're, you know, your foundation is this thing where you, uh, you have your foundation and your roots and then something grows out of it and there is a production and fruit, etc. It's very classical image that Cartes uses it too. Only in the, in the meditations or in the discord of the I think, where he says that the whole of philosophy is a tree. tree. Yeah. The, the roots are the it's logic or something in the tree, the, the trunk is physics. And then science. And no, no, the roots are metaphysics, the trunk is physics, and then the science is branch out, and the highest fruit from the tree is, is uh, medicine yeah, for, for, uh, for, for their garden. And of course, this is also all about uh, health and women. Just, just as a, I was just saying, kind of, uh, sort of parallels and, and configurations. But the tripartite structure of um, uh, Berman's project here, philosophy, astrology, theology, the way he develops that later on in the, in the, the um, preface, uh, does have an uncanny uh, um, affinity with uh, Hegel's tripartite structure of um, philosophy, logic, philosophy of nature, philosophy of spirit. It's yeah. Very exact. And, uh, and Berman has the same thing about spirit emerging in nature, and then that's what's treated in the third part of the system in, in, in theology is that theme of spirit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's very good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, let's see what we're going to do in the last few minutes. Oh, another. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to a few things. Um, 23 is 22 here, isn't it? Uh, the heavenly and hellish kings of nature have always wrestled one with the other and stood in great travail, even as a woman in birth, as a wife in their wood. Um, that is, uh, uh, again, a uh, as we will see as we go on, a very um, materialist idea. We're, I think I already mentioned last time the etymological relation to materia and mater. So the word for mat matter derives from, from mother. Yeah. Is, um, and, and again points to the idea that matter is a dynamic, creative thing that creates it, it's, uh, that can gives life itself. Yeah. Was well, that can't be almost turning away from the mother's lap. Mm -hmm. And Eckhart is turning away from the mother's lap. Eckhart also says uh, that women have got their heads covered and, and because they are only concentrated on the outer, outer realities. Um, there's, a, there's a latent uh, 
and maybe that has something to do with the, 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 the seeing the tax this project. Mm -hmm. He was charged with the military convent, so he was preaching this to the women. Yeah, 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 exactly. I realised that. Yeah, yeah. That, that's very strange. Yeah, how he how he how he sees that. But in traditional, or let's say, in, in other forms of materialism, you always have this 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 point coming back to the the maternal quality of nature. Uh, mother nature is also, of course, some, that's actually a notion that I think arises in enlightenment thought. But, um, but uh, so step, step mother nature, what can you still want to be a natural? So give us a new option. It's harder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so yeah. So I mean, you, you get the, of course the whole description as we have briefly indicated it of these elements. You can get it in the, in in the text, um, and then because we're almost done. I would like to, to maybe talk about this um, number 89, which is 88 in, uh, in the text here. Yeah. 89 German. Yeah. It's six. So it's in the second part of the preface. It's the fact to. Uh, yeah. He says that the, 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 the title on top, Morgan Rote Malfram, Aurora, is a secret mystery which is concealed from the smart, the, 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 the clever and the wise, as, as they will experience shortly. <laughs> so presumably once you start to read this you lose track completely yeah, with your traditional knowledge. To two paragraphs and he addresses Mr. Meister Kubling. Meister Kubling. Is that translated in English as Mr. Critic, or we might say Mr. Clavitox. Yeah, Mr. Clavitox, yeah. Who doesn't understand anything. Uh, is it, have you got it here in this? Uh, yeah, yeah. But where can I find it? No, no, I mean here on the Oh yeah, well it's, it's um, uh, uh, keep going down. <laughs> keep going, keep going, keep going. Mm -hmm. I don't know where you're going. Which page are you on? Uh, on page 16, if you want. That's the very end. That's the end of chapter 2. I think we just, just, find, just find it. Just, just find, find it. it. Okay, tell me what, what I should look for then. Mr. Critic. Oh, Mr. Critic, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was yeah. just a bit further up. A bit further up, yeah, from this, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's Mr. Chris. Yeah. Yeah. The supreme title is Aurora, it is the dawning of the day, the east of morning representing the rising of the sun. It is a secret mystery that conceals from the wise and prudent of this world. Um, Which are themselves sure to be sensible. But to those who read this book, continuance of heart, the desire of the Holy Spirit to place the hope in God only, it will not be in the secret of manifest knowledge. I will not explain this title, but commit to the judgment of the impartial reader who wrestles in the good quality of this world. So, yeah. Why this title? What do you think? Isn't there a mysticism this idea of illumination? It's, it's kind of some kind of mature and from St. Augustine onwards. Is that knowledge is not as St. Thomas thought, it comes from outside on the Aristotelian line, but it's, it's actually shines in your heart. So the more you purify it yourself, the more you become a place of manifestation of of God and light comes directly, knowledge coming directly to you, rather than by work, reading, or something. Yeah, yeah. That kind of speaks to the Akashin idea, doesn't it? That kind of... Uh, yeah. It is, it, is an, it, is, it is an illumination. 
That's right. He said in, in the um, uh, noble text, uh, Eckhart seems to be between morning knowledge and evening knowledge. And yeah. you see things in their diversity, and even you see things as all one, as you'll have a moment that image. So, yeah. so, so Eckhart might be more of a. Even completely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I come by the more evening person, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and he might be more a morning person. Mm. Think also of the evening land, Untergangs Abendlandes. Um, so the, the, the West or Europe as, as, as evening, the sun rises in the east. He says that dawning the day in the east. Um, the theme of enlightenment or illumination from the 18th century to Benjamin. And, um, and, and I think this has to do with what I think what you were saying, the, the fact that in, in these moments of twilight, I don't, we don't speak of twilight when we speak of the dawn, do we? But it is the same sort of thing. No, I, 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 think, I think you can, I mean. Because yeah. it just means half light, I mean. It is kind of half light, isn't yeah. it? It's in Zwiebicht. That's also the German word for it, yeah? the, the, the twilight, the double light. Um, so it, it makes, thinking back to the experience with which the verb is asked to write, it makes visible the dialectic of dark and light, as it were. And, uh, and in, in the, to make a very general statement, in those who, who orient themselves with the evening, as Hegel also does with his hour of Minerva, which he says it sets out uh, by even later than the evening when, the, when everything everything's really happened, but it's also an, an evening figure. Um, you, you get the idea that uh, thought or philosophy or maybe also illumination has to do with seeing what, what has been, or seeing what, what was once there, or seeing the truth in the sense of seeing, seeing things the way they are. Here, we would say that there is a similar kind of uh, dialectical awareness, as we've seen. There is a, an awareness that truth is something that's given in in a relation between dark and light, or between thought and not thought. Um, but it is in the, under the sign of a, a light that is coming. Yeah? It is the, the light of something that is new. It's interesting though, isn't it, that he says that those who will understand the mystery are those who read the book in singleness of heart, with a desire after the Holy Spirit and place their hope in God only. Yeah. So it's not those who read the book with an awareness of the duality or not duality, perhaps dialectical relation, who are going to understand it, but those who read it with a singleness of heart. I mean, that seems to be... That could also be part of the contradiction, couldn't it? But yeah. there's a tension there, I think. Yeah, especially because if you look at uh, uh, how the word heart is used in the text, yeah. it, it always has to do with being with being here and there, I think. Yeah. But it does not there in German, it's the Einfeld. Well, it doesn't say heart. No. What do you say? So it needs to book in Einfall. Yeah, it needs to book in Einfall. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but that's what it stands. Yeah, it's absolutely singleness. Mm -hmm. um, which is, in terms of Eckhart's text, is an evening figure, isn't it? Einfall. Um, aber wir begierde des Heiligen Geistes, die ihre Hoffnung allein in Gott stellen, wird das nicht ein Geheimnis sein, sondern eine öffentliche Erkenntnis. So, so yeah, there is a, that's why heart maybe is good, a <laughs> good word to use there, because he says reading it with einfalt, with simplicity, um, does not preclude, but actually includes reading it with a, a, a begir, a lust, of the, of her, uh, mm -hmm. what is a strong word for a desire in English, begir is that you crave it, yeah? a craving for the Holy Spirit, those who put their hope only in God. So those are the ones who, in terms of Eckhart's text, know that unum as necessarium, the, the one, you know, the one necessity. Um, and that's the Einfahrt, but it is a bit weird, eh? because we are not there. And that's maybe the Einfahrt with which it has to be read. And in that sense, a dialectical image comes back. This Einfahrt is for us never simply 
simple. Mm -hmm. it, is, it, is a, it is a relationality, uh, and a kind of paradoxical relationality, but in that relationality, the, the morning dawn can uh, actually emerge. It also, so, does it also mean you don't ask any questions? Um, mm -hmm. well, why do you say that? Mr. Critic would have a lot of questions, you mean. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that's, I think in all these texts there is, of course, a danger of becoming authoritarian and, you know, not, not much of the initiated and, and all, all of that is there. Yeah, and that's a philosophical, I don't know if you ever went to a philosophical meeting, but that's not a nice, nice thing to do from that perspective. Can I, can I, with this dialectic in mind, go back to the beginning of the text just a second, and that was the point that I tried to make when he talks about the, the tree, because the tree is, is sort of the world of ideas, but that is in the world. Yeah. So he does create gravity. So, so that's why I, I, I thought in the beginning we are going one step too quick by saying yeah. Yeah. That the world is good, but it is. The tree of thinking is placed in the world, so yeah. it, is, it, yeah. is, it is okay, and, and then you have the dialectic, which I think we have missed in the beginning. Yes, yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly that's right. And that's also what I want. Actually, what I wanted to say, oh, okay. well, more or less, was that so just as in Hegel, you get the idea the world completes itself through thought. You get that here too. The world needs us. Mm -hmm. Just as God needs man in, in, in Eckhart, to here the world needs us to become what it is. And hence the tree in the world. And hence the tree in the world and the tree in man, and hence Morgan Goethe does simply his mm. yeah? So that is that's the point, I think. More than Morgan Goethe, that is that is that is the the, the man, human face of all the world, not just of, of our human existence. And that's it is always the post humanist, because it, it spreads out the human across the whole world. And that's what is called Morgan Goethe. It's a notion of, 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 of fruitfulness. Um, just that the human being is the fruit of a tree. Uh, okay, so um, uh, we're, sorry, we're a little bit over time, but uh, um, I think what we have seen is, or what I've tried to show is, with all the problems associated with it, I'm not saying it's all final knowledge, but that you can see two important principles that will come back time and time again in this return thought emerge here in a context which shows how they can become the basis of a concept of matter or materialism. Next time we will look at Leibniz. I will put the references for the readings up uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Um, and um, you, will, you will see that these themes come back in, in exciting and new ways in the of Leibniz. So thanks very much for your participation and look forward to seeing you next time.